of the videos. Uh, this is going to be the foreign policy in Asia. What you're going to see is that it definitely varies from country to country in general. The countries that develop a more capitalist economy are going to be the ones that have a more favorable relationship with just defeated and just heavily bombed by the United States actually emerged from the Second World War um, as an ally of the United States. So let's think about why that happens. <clears throat> in the immediate years after World War I, the U.S. Uh, occupies Japan uh, in a similar way that, you know, the European countries were occupied after World War II, so, in, in, you know, in the way that Germany was occupied. Um, and uh, in this period of occupation, the U.S. is going to work to demilitarize Japan. Um, and they're also going to take the colonies away from Japan that they had established in their eras of aggression before World War II. So, for example, uh, Japan's going to lose Manchuria. It's going to lose Taiwan, right? And then um, towards the end of the occupation period, the U.S. enters into a series of treaties with Japan that allows them to establish military bases throughout the country. So this map down here shows us the locations of some of these uh, military bases. And basically what this means is that the U.S. is now going to have uh, more oversight over this region. Um, and they're also going to be able to prevent Japan from remilitarizing in the future. Um, even more importantly, you're going to see that the U.S. Uh, works with Japan to revitalize their economy. And uh, their economy, because they're getting so much aid from the United States, is going to develop into a free market capitalist system. And that's one of the major reasons why the U.S. becomes a strong ally of Japan. Um, they also set up a new constitution, which uh, establishes a parliamentary democracy in Japan. And this is also significant because it, in a lot of ways, fulfills those principles of self-determination that were set forth by the Atlantic Charter. Um, so again, uh, at the end of this period of occupation and the series of treaties, the U.S. and Japan actually develop a stronger relationship. Um, that's not normally the case in Asian countries. Uh, in the case of China, we will see a much more tense relationship emerge. A lot of this is because China, um, going into the Second World War, was already in a period of civil war. There were two major political parties in China that were conflicting with one another. <clears throat> Um, and there was the Chinese Communist Party on one side that was led by Mao Zedong, or Chairman Mao, this gentleman here. And then there was the Nationalist Party, which was led by Chiang Kai-shek. The Nationalist Party was allied with the United States. If the Nationalist Party had won the conflict, they would have established a more capitalist economy in China. <clears throat> but nonetheless, in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party defeats Chiang Kai-shek's Chinese Nationalist Party. The Nationalist Party is forced to flee to Taiwan. And basically what this means, as far as the U.S. is concerned, is that they lost China, right? China now is officially a communist country. There were hopes that the Nationalist Party would take over the country and it would ultimately become capitalist, but it's not. And in a lot of ways, Truman gets blamed for this, right? Um, it's not without a struggle. Um, before the Civil War ended, the U.S. did something similar to what it did in Greece and Turkey. It pumped about $400 million to aid the Chinese capitalist, uh, Chinese Nationalist Party, rather, from, uh, to try to stop them from falling to the communists. But this strategy fails. So unlike Greece and Turkey, the containment policy actually doesn't work in Japan. So uh, the consequence of this is that there's going to be a very tense relationship between the U.S. and China for the next 30 years or so. So that's a long, long period. And it's so tense that the U.S. actually does not recognize uh, the Chinese government. Okay, so uh, another major example of how the policy of containment is extending into Asia is with the Korean War. Um, what happens here is that after World War II, Korea uh, is occupied by two different places. Um, the northern half was occupied by the Soviet Union, and so it's going to fall into communist influence. Its leader is going to be Kim Il-sung, who wants to establish a communist country throughout Korea. And then the southern half was occupied by the United States, and their leader was Syngman Rhee, and he was going to establish a nationalist or uh, capitalist uh, system there. Um, so basically, uh, Kim Il-sung in the north wanted to reunite Korea entirely, uh, as a communist country. So the North Koreans start to invade South Korea, as you can see here on this map. These red lines show the North Korean invasion. Um, they capture the S South Korean capital of Seoul, and uh, the fullest extent, they get very, very far into the peninsula. They almost capture the entire thing. But in the meantime, the UN Security Council is trying to figure out a way to respond to this invasion. 
Um, the Soviet representative of the Security Council had actually boycotted this meeting. So because of that, the UN Security Council does agree to actually send troops into Korea. Um, for the most part, this is a U.S. Uh, you know, this is the, a U.S. military presence. Um, so we're going to see that um, a U.S. general, Douglas MacArthur, is going to command uh, the UN forces in Korea. He's going to be very successful at first, as you can see here in this map. Right? Actually, no, in this map, I'm sorry. Um, these blue lines uh, represent the UN counteroffensive, and so they're able to push the North Koreans much farther into their territory, and the farthest they reach is this red line, and I want you to pay attention to this area here because this is the border between uh, North Korea and China. So basically you have the UN counteroffensive staring over the border into China, and General MacArthur makes the argument that they should go further. So MacArthur calls for expanding the war by bombing and invading China, but the Chinese do not want that to happen, so they amass a huge amount of soldiers on their end of the border, about 100,000 or so, and then they launch a counterattack, which we see here. So basically the Chinese and North Koreans are now going to push again into South Korea, and this is going to result in a very costly stalemate. Um, not much uh, movement of the front is going to take place over the next couple of years. Um, and Truman is going to be upset with the fact that MacArthur sort of goes against his orders. Truman really only wanted to enforce the policy of containment. MacArthur wanted to go further and actually, you know, push communism farther uh, inward. So Truman fires MacArthur for insubordination and going against official U.S. policy. And uh, by 1951, they start armistice talks, but they drag on for two years. By 1953, they do establish an armistice, but the result is that North Korea and South Korea remain divided. They establish a new border between North and South. This border becomes heavily militarized. You still have troops staring across either side at each other, and the idea is that civil war could result at any time. <clears throat> the consequences of the war were very bad for Korea itself. There were thousands of casualties. Um, and uh, it's also a very negative uh, event in history for the Americans. Um, first off, we realize that at this point the Cold War is going to be a global affair. Um, we have expanded the containment principle now uh, beyond Europe. Americans are also disillusioned because they sort of took more of the side of, of MacArthur. They wanted to keep pushing communism further, further inward. Um, but when Truman fires MacArthur, we know that's not going to happen. And also because the war results in this armistice, um, it seems like nobody really won. And so the idea was that this, um, that the policy of containment might be much more difficult to achieve through military victories than they originally thought. Um, the Korean War also results in Truman being very unpopular. Um, basically because A, he fired MacArthur, who was very popular, and B, he doesn't, he's not more aggressive on communism, so a lot of people accuse him of being soft on communism. So despite the fact that Truman does use the war to justify expanding the military, um, he is incredibly unpopular, and by 1952, Truman announces that he's not going to run for re-election, um, and then the Democrat that takes his place, Adlai Stevenson, doesn't really offer tangible solutions to problems abroad as well. And so we're going to see a turnover and there's going to be a Republican victory in the 1952 uh, political election. And uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower is going to become the next president. So basically what we see is that the Korean War gives us a sense of how, um, how the Cold War is maybe a much more difficult uh, fight than originally thought. It's going to result in... Um, so a lot of a uh, uh, decline in the power of the Democratic Party, and um, and that is what's happening in Asia. So the future video is going to look at domestic affairs uh, during the Cold War. So stay tuned for that one. Thank you.